You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for a special edition episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. <laughs> So I wasn't prepared to do this. I really just thought that, you know, I was going to head off to a special place this weekend and I was going to chill and just, you know, have a good time and vibe out. But it seemed like everybody kind of wanted something from me, given how big and epic this was. And so I thought to myself, hmm, I also need to drop something else and then I was going to talk about it, right? So you all know what I'm talking about. Clearly you came on this episode, you see the special edition episode. So I'm talking about this Helen Gim situation. Um, And I also have a surprise that doesn't have anything to do with Helen Gim. So we're going to kind of like combine this as a special edition episode. I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to also talk about the next thing. And then, yeah. And then after that, I will be headed to, you know, that special place over the weekend that if you listen to the last episode, you know what I'm talking about. But because I imagine there's going to be some more people listening to this particular episode, I am not going to disclose where I will be going this weekend. So let's talk about this. So I've been in the news, you know, I've been in the tabloids or the, the, the blogs and the news and the press because of this situation involving um, now mayoral candidate Helen Gim. So, long story short, last episode, I talked about the Union League. The Union League was in deep controversy because of the fact that they decided to give Ron DeSantis, who's the governor of Florida, a big conservative. Um, people are speculating he's going to run for president. He is basically Trump, but with competence. And people are you know, up in arms about him. He's pushing, you know, don't say gay. He's banning African-American studies course, AP courses. This man is a problem. But somehow the Union League, right, which have had a history of being elitist and, you know, recognizing toxic, problematic ass people, um, they basically decided to give him the Abraham Lincoln Award and honor him at that place in spite of outcry from the community, activists, politicians, everyone else. Well, I told you all last week that I thought that the politicians that were out there were, you know, being performative and that some of the, and I'm not saying everyone out there was performative, but I I knew that there was going to be some hypocrisy and I literally called it like I was forecasting it like I was forecasting, you know, rain or something. And it really hit me that this is really what, you know, is going on out here. So I was taken aback. To be honest, I was I was shook. I was I was taken aback um, by the performativeness. Now, on Monday, which is the day the uh, my podcast episode dropped, Helen Gim was announced as being endorsed by the Working Families Party, which is a progressive third party in Philadelphia. Not surprised. Her friend, you know, um, Kendra Brooks endorses her, you know, spoke highly of her. Working Families Party's back in her. She's over there by the Harriet Tubman statue, which is symbolic, I suppose. And, you know, for this situation, but she's not black. So, you know, I digress. So it's a lot of things going on here. But hours later, Helen Gim shows up to the Union League. And I'm like, what? She's there hobnobbing drinking and I, I guess she was drinking she may have not been drinking but there was an open bar there was lots of food you know um and basically this is a complete 180 because Helen Gim was one of the people who spoke very boldly and loud against you know DeSantis's visit against the Union League it, it was weird and so you know she had said, you know, like last week, you know, Philly quote on Twitter, Philly will always stand against the racism, homophobia, xenophobia, and the bigotry that the Union League decided to honor today. Hate has no home here. Hashtag by DeSantis. 
And, you know, spoken like a true progressive. I'm like, okay. You know, nothing wrong there. You know, think that that's lock, step, and key. Um, you know, because it's a moment. So it's it's a moment for me where I'm processing some of this and it's a lot, you know, because in my mind, I'm like, you know, what's going on? And it was it was a lot, you know, it was a lot in my head. It, it was just like, this can't be true. So somebody who was at the event sent it to me. And that's when everything got really weird. So I guess this is the best way I can remember it in my head. This was the music in my head when I found out. Jay-Z. Fuck Jay-Z. Fuck Jay-Z. Yeah, it was ether. It was it was ether mode. It it was it was ether. It was the ether moment. It was the moment when I was just like, what's going on here? And I just thought I should ask the question. I thought I had to ask the question. It was that moment when I was just like, and I was just like, is this who I think it is? And I just couldn't keep, I, I just couldn't contain myself. So I wasn't sure if the picture was old. So, you know, we verify over here. And I just wanted to see what was going on. So I, I looked at the picture. I was like, wait a minute. She wore this same tired khaki blazer when she got endorsed outside of this building hours ago. Like like right across the street, right? Where City Hall is. And then she decided to show up to this event. So people were like, well, what is this event? You know, the event was basically this, it was an event for the General Building Contractors Association's annual meeting. It wasn't even like a big grand event. I mean, it was grand. I mean, it was the Union League, I guess, the drinks. But it wasn't like it was like this fundraiser. It wasn't a political fundraiser for her. It was just her. And, you know, to all the people on the streets gossiping, saying, oh, there was some other politicians. No, there was not. As of the recording of this podcast, there's been no receipts, no names, no pictures of anybody else there. So cut it out, knock it out, knock it off. It was her. She went. And matter of fact, there was other elected officials and city council people that were invited that rejected their invitation because they were in solidarity with not supporting the Union League. But of all people, Helen Gim showed up. So when I received this photo and I verified that it was her, um, I went on Twitter and I asked her, I said, look, at her, because you know you got to at people, right? Put the period by the at sign so they know it's real. And I asked, were you at the Union League today after protesting against it last week? Asking for clarity. Like, I just wanted to know for clarity. And then I shared the picture to confirm that this was her. Um, And it was a weird, bizarre 180. I just don't understand why she did it. But that must take a lot of hubris, arrogance, ego to, like, think that you're somehow above approach. Because, to be honest, this is something she's been doing her political career is really been out here calling out Democrats to carpet, going in at Republicans, which is her fair right. But the inconsistencies are weird. And I don't understand that. You know, I, I don't understand that. And her supporters, you know, her supporters have, you know, 
trashed the Union League. You know, I'm looking at sweets and people are cracking jokes about how they went to the Union League once and the food wasn't great and found the bathrooms meh. You know, talking about, can you imagine having a troll account defending Union League in 2023? You know, other people was talking about they've been too pragmatic. Like sometimes mayors will have to meet with people they don't align, always align with. Sometimes mayors will have to go to the Union League. Is a Union League not net bad? Yes. Have I myself showed up there? Yes. They're trying to backpedal. Now, now let's be clear that we're backpedaling now on this. And this is from Dina Driscoll, who's a part of Bike Main Mama Philadelphia. She's on Twitter. And she's like, I'm too pragmatic. Sometimes mayors will have to meet with people they don't always align with. Sometimes mayors will have to go to the Union League. Is the Union League net bad? Yes. Have I showed up there? Yes. Let's be very clear. I've been to the Union League before. There have been organizations of color like the Philadelphia Tribune and Aldea who have thrown events there you know, because they've gotten special discounted rates and sponsorships and things. And I understood what it was giving. But to be clear, as of last week, everybody came together, including NAACP of Philadelphia and other groups, and said, we need to go somewhere else. Now, I never hosted an event there myself, but the other organizations, the understanding was, nah. Because you got the Pyramid Club, the Fiddler Club, and other places. Now these 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 white progressives are now trying to cape for what she did. Nah, nah, no. You don't get the chance to double and backtrack. Keep that same energy. Because I'm going to tell you that throughout Helen's career, she has not kept that same energy. Last year in July, you know, Armin Brown was out with his his children at an event. Now he's a mayoral candidate. And there was a story about it. I remember like it was yesterday. He was out at some French um, casual, fast casual spot. Helen Ginn was there, you know, doing her own thing. He was there to went in to get some things with his kids. Dr. Oz just so happened to be there as well. And Amon stopped and chatted with him for a little bit and shook his hand. And she took, Helen basically took a picture and she sent it out to press. Or at least the picture was coming out from her. We got that confirmed. She sent it out to Politico. I think Holly Otterbein was the one who had intercepted it. But it was floating around. And she was there. And Amon said that he knew that she saw him and that that's how it spread like wildfire. She has since went to criticize it and criticize him being there and said all these problematic things about it. And that was her prerogative. But she was relentless in the infinu infinu insinuation about what the nature of his brief encounter with Dr. Oz was, but she didn't keep her foot off his neck. I remember when Chris Rabb had encountered Dr. Oz at an event, I believe, in his district where involved, um, a, you know, he was trying to talk about community issues or black issues, and Rabb felt like, you know, this man is in my district. I want to sit there and confront this man head on. Well, a lot of progressives, white progressives and others said, why are you there? You should have been there. Helen jumped in in the fight and said he shouldn't have been there and doubled down. She has always had a history of doing this to other people. So the fact that now there's a racial double standard and a bias and that people are trying to cape for her is the not the same grace that was given to black men in politics or even black progressives, or even black, you know, folks that are, that are super moderates like Amin. They didn't care. They didn't care when it came after Isaiah Thomas because he ended up getting in some, you know, interview with a woman from the American Commonwealth Organization. And that was, you know, controversial. But again, they did not care about optics or context. They just said wrong is wrong. And they doubled down and went in. So this is a common pattern and a double standard that is racist, that that folks will always find a way to make excuses for their faves, especially those who are not black. There's a double standard that is held. And we see this happen in politics often all the time. So part of the problem here, um, and, and, and what I want to, and what I, you know, was concerned about the most is that we are in a situation where we see these double standards. We do. We see them. And her response after all this controversy controversy, 
was an apology. You know, she said, listen, earlier this evening, this was yesterday, I made a stop at the annual meeting of an event that I have attended in the past. It was a mistake. I apologize for attending. I have been very clear that I oppose the Union League's honoring of Ron DeSantis. I have also made clear that the Union League has been problematic long before DeSantis' appearance. I will continue to uphold the value that Philadelphia has no place for hate. I look forward to talking with Philadelphians about the city we want to build together. So that was the entire nature of the apology. And to be honest, I thought it was milquetoast. I thought it was intellectually dishonest. I thought it was like tasteless because, you know, come on, let's be real. You made a mistake. A mistake is when you do something or you go to something and you don't know what it is and what it is about. And the crazy part is, is that we don't take some time um, Yeah, we we don't we don't take the time to reflect on what some of that stuff means. We don't. You know, it's it's very telling in so many ways. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, (sighs) what I will say is that it's hard to hold all this in, especially as a black queer person, because what we recognize in this moment, specifically as a black queer person, is that when politicians like Helen Gim, you know, pander and participate in performativeness, it it has an impact on our livelihoods. Bait and, sw- and switches like this are not just simple, I stumbled, my bad. It actually reinforces the harm and also opens the door for other people to do such. So now that Helen Gim went back to the Union League, now if Alan Dom goes, because I've heard by sources that apparently there's somebody, one of Dom's supporters want to hold a fundraiser from at the Union League, and I think his team is trying to figure out how not to let that happen. But, like, if he decides to go at this point, it's almost like you open the door, Helen, to that. And so then it becomes, what are the consequences? It's like, okay, I went, I'm sorry, and that's it, right? Because that's what you would expect, even though there was lots of condemnation outside that building the week before, and now there is expect- expectation. I just think it's unbecoming. I think that she's untrustworthy. I don't trust her. I think that someone who could just completely say one thing and do another, so cavalier, so obvious, so blatant, it's just a person that's going to make their own choices and they want things that don't apply. Because I know for a fact, and we all know this, and this is what I mean by double standards on race. We all know that if, you know, Sherelle Parker would have went or Derek Green would have went, that the progressives would have had a field day. White progressives would have had a field day. Um, Because I'm black and I'm progressive. But that being said, I'm also practical. And also am not going to have any blind allegiance to any of these elected officials. Because that's the problem. These people idolize these elected officials. That they feel like when these people make a mistake, then they feel like they're accountable. No. When they fuck up, just say what it is and keep it moving. Don't create an excuse. Don't sugarcoat it. But it's just too much complicity. And, and, and this is the disgusting part of it. Because people's lives are at stake. This is a man who's getting, you're, you're giving your presence. If you know your power and your visibility and you really understand how important your representation is, why would you give it to an institution at this rate? Like, let's be very clear. A lot of black people have went to the Union League in the past. You know, a lot of Latinx people, a lot of Asian people, a lot of folks have went. But the reality is, is that when that moment happened, community came together and decided that enough was enough. And, and 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 Helen opt in. She could have been quiet. She could just not say anything. But she made a very strong declarative point in position. And then she basically, you know, 
backpedaled on that move and that decision altogether. And I know that had anyone else in this race would have been and participated in that, there would have been no mercy. So I think that it was important to criti be critical of her. And of course, because I did my job, because I was a journalist and I was the first journalist to break this on social media, you know, um, everybody else was met with some level of sidebar chatting up. There were other colleagues in the industry that did defend me and support me, but they always want to frame it one way, right? It's a, you railed against Helen Gim, you this, you that. Are you a real journalist? All of this Trump, it, Trump type fake news shit that is really very biased because I don't hear people, you know, when, 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 you know, Anna Orso wrote a tough story about Jeff Brown last week. I didn't hear people out here publicly questioning her, you know, credibility because simply their favorite candidate was being, you know, called out. But I say something, I publish something, I write something, I speak truth to power, I challenge it, and all of a sudden it's not real journalism. It's it's hate, it's this, it's that. So it's a lot of double standards that are racial. And I'm telling you all, stay woke and pay, and pay very close attention to how people are trying to frame and defend and, and dog walk people out of this issue. It's 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 too it's such a rookie mistake and it's baffling to me because it shouldn't even be a rookie mistake at this point. It's like you should know the optics. It's just where is your team? Where's your friends? The Kidra and 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 Jamie got say that they think this was okay? Like I just not that it, you know, they're not responsible for her, but it's just interesting that you know, for all of the performativeness and the statements and the declarations and the photos, you would think that at this point, she, of course, would not be doing anything like this so, so much in so in the middle of the, of the race. But, you know, this is what ego, what happens with ego. And to be quite honest, you know, I wrote a piece for Philly Mag, you know, that came out and the headline goes, Helen Gim's hip hypocritical return to the Union League isn't her first misstep. It's not. It's not. There was there was other things that took place um, over the years. You know, there was a bait and switch over the years. Um, I think about a lot of the situations where she flip flopped. You know, with dealing with corrupt politicians backing them. You know, in twenty nineteen, she. She basically said that Sheriff Jewel Williams, former Joe, former Sheriff Jewel Williams, should resign after there was set, there were lawsuit settlements related to sexual harassment allegations made by former employees of his office. Now he was never criminally charged, and he has denied wrongdoing. But you know, she said, "Look, she believes women, and she believes victims, and that and that's a real you know that's a real valid point." And so she said he should step down. He didn't, but he ended up losing his race anyway. However, what's been also very telling, and this is the part that gets me, is that when Bobby Heenan was, you know, indicted and, you know, he was going through his controversy before being convicted, she backed him once again to be majority leader. And when asked about, you know, her concerns or whatever, she told the Philadelphia Inquirer, you know, all allegations of corruption are concerning and deserve to be heard in court. But then framed it around, you know, this idea that like, you know, you know, I asked myself, well, why did, you know, what was the reason? Could it have been that she was, she didn't want to, you know, kind of buck at local 98 labor boss, Johnny Doc, who was basically Heenan's co-conspirator and also was one of her biggest political allies at the time. You know, it's just like there was other incentives. But then it also made me think about another time in 2019 when she basically, you know, you know, got involved and joined an unusual band of moderates and Republicans to kill this 2019 proposal that was supported by city health officials and anti-drug drug activists that really was trying to basically cut at pharmaceutical sale representatives that, that would have made them register for the city, but also to track their gifts to donors. They were cutting the bribery. And Bill Greenley proposed this, and he was really upset that he made a tweet basically saying that, they're, you know, naming the members of city council who voted against the bill that, you know, that would 
banned pharmaceutical companies from giving gifts to donors, which then included Bobby Heenan, no surprise, Maria Canoa Sanchez, Helen Gim, you know, Derek Green, Mark Squilla, David O, Al, you know, Tomberg, and Alan Dom. Like, they all agreed to that. But even more interesting is that her husband, whose name is Brett Flattery, he works for Mirasource Bergen, which is one of the largest drug distributor, distributors in the country. And the crazy part is right now they're being sued federally for helping to fuel the opioid epidemic. So that tells me a whole lot about the political implications and everything that's surrounding Gim's double standards. I mean, next to her, you know, creating a charter school, but then act being later on anti-charter school. There's a lot of contradictions. And, you know, I don't like it. You know, I really, really don't like it. I find it to be... Yeah, I don't find it to be good. Some would have said that she would have, she's arguably the front runner. And, you know, we have little data to confirm or deny it. But with the type of money that she has, you know, been able to garner over the years and her vote getter popularity, she definitely probably is one of the leading, you know, candidates in the race. But that carries a different type of target in a way that was, you know, her back, that was different from how, you know, and why, you know, it, you know, how it's very different compared to how others run races. So, for example, if you run for city council at large, you, you, you know, it's not a really competitive race in the sense of mudslinging. I mean, there's mudslinging, but not really as much, right? Like people are focused on trying to get in the top five. So they don't spend too much time beefing with each other because you got to earn your position on your slot. And so with mayoral races, that's different. Everybody's fighting each other because it's a royal rumble until one person is on the ballot to win. Now they now they know there's other people on the ballot, but you want to have a competitive advantage. So that's very telling within itself. But overall, I just really think the outcome of this election is now unpredictable. Like, it's really unpredictable. And I don't necessarily think that Helen Gim doesn't have a chance. I mean, you know, she'd still do. But she can't come into the race with the same kind of air that she once did. She's going to be humbled a little bit in how she tries to combat other candidates. Because I expect that in the next several forums, there is now some talking points and fuel that's going to drive the way that some of these candidates begin to challenge each other because it can't be 11 candidates. You know, the campaign finance reports is, reports have come in. There's going to be a process. And I think some people, you know, the, the heavy hitters are going to be hit, you know, by some of the things that they do. This is politics. This is a battle. This is no lay down and take it. People are really, taking this race seriously. The 100th mayor of Philadelphia has to be consistent, culturally competent, and and not performative. You know, this is a serious job. This is not for slackers. This is not a little popularity contest. And to the people out here who do not understand how politics really work and want to make this super personal and act like, you know, someone's entitled to a position, you better think again. Journalists are going to do their jobs. People are going to speak truth to power. People are going to keep that same energy. You know, I think it was very telling that earlier this weekend, you know, I think I was talking about how people were questioning my politics and trying to assume that, oh, you're going against Jeff Brown. You're going against this white man. You know, you know, you know, we already know his politics. So they thought, oh, black, queer, young guy is going to go for Helen Gim because her politics. Listen, you don't know what I think. You don't have any clue, you know, because the reality is that when you're doing this work, there is a level of keeping it fair and balanced. Any candidate that is doing something that seems out of step is going to get the work. That's what we're supposed to do. And you're asking the wrong person. Check my track record. Every type of politician that have ran for office and have been elected in Philadelphia has had their fair shake of challenge because I'm not challenging people. I'm challenging power. And I think people are so caught up in trying to politicize it and weaponize identity politics. It's not how it works. 
I've been critical of black men, straight men, queer candidates, white people, black people, Asian people, women, non-binary people, people from Philly, people not from Philly, people with Ivy degrees, people that's indicted, people that's not indicted. Everybody has been under some level of rightful criticism, critique, or questioning from me because as a journalist that covers politics, every politician is not above approach. So I am encouraging people to really think carefully before you assume anyone's identities in politics. And I think that that's something that has been disgusting because it kind of reminds me of like the Bernie bro energy that I had received back in 2016 where there are people saying, you know, how are you doing this? You're, you're voting against your, your own, your own interest. And it's like, what do you know of my interests? Now to be transparent, you know, I did support Bernie Sanders in the primaries personally in 2020, but at the end of the day, I was critical of Bernie Sanders in the past. I've been critical of Joe Biden in the past. Like, there's no, you know, there's no litmus with me. And I think the problem is, is that, you know, white journalists in politics locally do not get the same type of microscope because I am in many ways treated as an exotic fucking animal where, you know, anything I do or say is given a higher microscope and that is also racially biased and skewed because for some reason people feel like I should be, you know, kissing the feet of whatever person is supposed to be speaking to my interest. But I can smell bullshit from all away. And I just think that Helen has been someone who has said things that has not been consistent with her actions. Her words and her actions have not aligned. That is a fact. And she's admitted it. And for her supporters that are trying to find a way to, you know, glorify bullshit, let it go. Acknowledge she was wrong and and seek to repair harm. I don't know what that is. I don't know what, what she should do. But at the end of the day, spend more time listening and learning than trying to be super defensive. She made a deliberate choice. And she would have not been given... Another candidate in this race would have not been given the same grace from you all as you all are giving her. And I think people are starting to see a lot of these people for what they are. Watch yourself out here. Check yourself out here. And that's that. So, interesting enough, um, I got the opportunity from Macmillan um, Audio to drop a sneak peek of my upcoming book, The Case for Council Culture, the audiobook version. And I was trying to figure out like how I wanted to do this because I was like, well, you know, it'd be weird to just drop a, a random snippet. But I thought, okay, this because this is a special edition episode and this is the first special edition episode we've done of 2023, I thought this would be the perfect time to tie these things together, especially since we're on the topic of council culture. Um, even though I don't, you know, I, I, I'm I not saying, we're, you know, Helen Gim should be canceled. I'm just saying that there is a coincidence here. That's all. So where I stand on it, I think it'd be a great conversation. And, you know, I think there's some, some things that, you know, you know, can be learned. So I was very interesting. Um, I was very interested in you know, providing this cool sneak peek clip. Um, what's really great about it is that I think that this clip is somehow symbolic to some of what is being talked about right now. And it's from my chapter, When Counseling Was the Only Option. Um, this isn't the entire chapter, to be clear, but it's a cool extended clip that I think you all would enjoy. Um, and I think it'll be fun. Um, and it's exclusively to earnestly speaking. No one else has heard this for the first time ever. You all, the public, will get a sample of the audiobook right here to hear a piece of this chapter. Um, of course, as you know, you can pre-order the audiobook on Amazon and other places where audiobooks are sold. It's pre-ordered. You can. It's a really great rate out right now. Or you can order a hardback book or you can order both. Um, of course, you'll get the audiobook. The first thing on Tuesday, February 21st of this year, which is a great way to kick off February, Black History Month, and everything else in between. So I can't wait for you all to 
be able to kick off the new month. Um, you know, it's February. And to be able to enjoy this exclusive first time clip of my audiobook. So take a listen. When counseling was the only option. Council culture is not the spontaneous whim it's often characterized as, but can serve as an intentional final move when all hope is lost for the marginalized. On March 24, 2018, more than 1.2 million people across America protested to cancel our nation's pervasive gun culture. Following the tragic school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, Earlier that year, Cameron Caskey and classmates quickly organized an event to galvanize public opinion around gun violence. The protest was led by progressive Gen Zers who were fed up with the ongoing gun violence that had taken the lives of their family and friends and essentially their future. The target was the National Rifle Association, the controversial group that lobbies for gun ownership and reduced regulations. This protest was just as much about calling for the NRA's demise as it was about calling on legislators to finally act. As one of the largest protests in American history, the March for Our Lives was a message made loud and clear that council culture was the only plausible option left after years of government resistance to insensible gun control legislation. It had become accepted wisdom that going up against the NRA was a fool's errand and that any politician or activist group who tried it would lose. These kids were telling the world they had nothing left to lose. To the leaders, skeptics, and cynics who told us to sit down and stay silent, wait your turn, Kasky said to the crowd during the Washington, D.C. rally. Welcome to the revolution. To all the politicians out there, if you take money from the NRA, you have chosen death, Alex Wind, a junior at Stoneman Douglas at the time, told the audience. If you have not expressed to your constituents a public stance on this issue, you have chosen death. If you do not stand with us by saying we need to pass common sense gun legislation, you have chosen death. And none of the millions of people marching in this country today will stop until they see those against us out of office because we choose life. The impact of the March for Our Lives was pivotal in putting the national gun violence debate back in the public eye. After previous mass shootings, including the tragic Pulse nightclub incident in 2016 and Sandy Hook Elementary School attack in 2012, the redundant thoughts and prayers to the victims statement will go out from liberal and conservative politicians alike with very little follow-up. Sure, there would often be a high-profile candlelight vigil or temporary public awareness campaigns, such as when a group of liberal celebrities got together to push the demand a plan on gun control public service announcement in December 2012 following Sandy Hook. But a collective movement to overhaul gun culture in America had yet to be carried out on a massive scale. The March for Our Lives reflected pent-up frustration from a new generation who was fed up with the apathy of their elders. To them, there was a lot of talk and no walk when it came to demanding universal background checks on gun sales and a ban on assault rifles. They wanted guns gone, or at least harder to obtain. They didn't care if their demands made them appear to be radical or polarizing, for the cost of complicity with the status quo had proven to be death. What separated this movement from previous anti-gun groups was the reaction to it. While many lauded these young people for speaking out, right-wing media, the NRA, and its proxies chose to go on the offensive. In a disappointing move, the right launched attacks on the teen leaders of the March for Our Lives movement. Fox News anchor Tucker Carlson whined that Emma Gonzalez, David Hogg, Sam Fuentes, and the rest were, quote, self-righteous kids screaming at you on TV. Meghan McCain sprouted that Hogg's use of the F-word wasn't productive. Republican Maine State House candidate Leslie Gibson said Gonzalez was a, quote, skinhead lesbian who did nothing to impress her. 
suffice to say, it was a bad look. Unless, of course, the right was hoping to help crystallize the David and Goliath image by criticizing kids for not wanting to be shot at school. Like many other people throughout history, the youth behind the March for Our Lives were using council culture because it was their only option. Most of them were too young to vote or run for office. Two more traditional ways of making change. They lacked a traditional kind of power. With the help of social media, they mobilized the public and galvanized resources to call for stronger gun control. David Hogg posted an NRA-style ad on Twitter asking, what if our politicians weren't the bitch of the NRA? They held protests, organized school walkouts, created petitions, demanded legislative change to end assault weapons being sold commercially. In the end, they succeeded in making gun control a top policy issue that has yet to leave the public's consciousness. Cancel culture was something that no one could stop them from enacting. This last chance quality can be seen in council culture throughout history. In 1964, during a speech with Malcolm X at a rally in the Williams Institutional CME Church in Harlem, civil rights icon Fannie Lou Hamer spoke these famous words. All my life I've been sick and tired. Now I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hamer, who was running for U.S. Senate in the Jim Crow South, was a leader in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, an organization that was calling out discriminatory voting practices at the time. The state of Mississippi made it extremely difficult for Black people to vote. Hamer herself had to write the Associated Literacy Test three times before passing it and being allowed to vote. There was no doubt that Hamer knew she was going to lose her election, given the racist voter suppression she faced making her determination to call out the injustice even nobler. Her campaign was an indictment of American racism and how it oppressed its most diverse citizens. Calls for the cancellation of Jim Crow laws were motivated by a group of people who were sick and tired of being sick and tired of the rampant white supremacy they experienced. Given how the Black vote was suppressed, council culture became their only available option. Although she didn't win the seat in the Senate, Hamer continued her activism by giving speeches at universities and colleges, as well as working on Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People's Campaign and launching the Freedom Farm Cooperative. In the end, Hamer's activism did more than she probably could have ever done in office, advancing the voting rights of Black and Brown Southerners and leading efforts to help fracture the legislative white supremacy of Mississippi at a time when it felt impossible. In 1964, Jim Crow laws were overturned by the Civil Rights Act, and in 1965, by the Voting Rights Act. The breakthroughs of Shirley Chisholm, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris, Stacey Abrams, and many others would have not been achievable without the radical racial and gender inclusions Hamer politically fought for with her acts of civil disobedience. The successes we now hold in such high regard today came, at least in part, from a cancel culture that was pursued by someone who'd had enough with the status quo, even though she began from a place of very little power. Some systems of power are nearly impossible to change from within. Hollywood, it turns out, is one of those systems. The performers who came out in numbers to share their experiences of being sexually harassed and abused during the rise of the hashtag MeToo movement, which of course grew to encompass many industries and workplaces outside of Hollywood as well, did so because they had suffered silently for years. Maybe they tried to quietly manage the situation. Maybe they'd even warn each other about dangerous bosses. Many of those survivors, including actresses such as Lupita Nyong'o and Selma Hayek, did not originally seek to cancel the once illustrious Hollywood career of convicted sex offender Harvey Weinstein. However, cancellation eventually became a necessity when there were no other options available. Their careers, safety, and livelihoods depended on it. In a December 2017 op-ed for the New York Times, 
Hayek wrote extensively about the sexual harassment she experienced from Weinstein while producing the 2002 film Frida. Ranging from requesting that she take a shower with him to asking if he could perform oral sex on her and the retaliation that would come from rejecting him. I don't think he hated anything more than the word no, Hayek wrote. And with every refusal came Harvey's Machiavellian rage. In the op-ed, Hayek recalls that Weinstein treated her differently when he was finally convinced that I was not going to earn the movie the way he had expected and tried to give the role she had perfected for years to another actress as a form of punishment. After she threatened to sue, Weinstein gave Hayek what she described as a list of impossible tasks, which involved raising $10 million for the film, securing a critically acclaimed director, and securing other A-list co-stars. After she achieved these lofty, nearly impossible goals, Hayek was then beholden to Weinstein, who, quote, was not only rejected, but also about to do a movie he did not want to do. She would then endure multiple instances of animosity, emotional abuse, and career setbacks because of her initial refusal to have sex with Weinstein. It would not be until she broke her silence during the hashtag MeToo movement that her career struggles were explained. Many other actresses would come forward with stories of enduring Weinstein's horrific behavior. And no wonder they were afraid to talk about it. Weinstein had been able to ruin the careers of many actresses just for rejecting him. What would he do if they told the truth about their encounters with him? Weinstein's power in Hollywood was supersized, and he was known for wielding his power ruthlessly. Though it seems baffling, such abuses were, and still are, an open secret in Hollywood and no one seems to care about the victims until the industry is forced to acknowledge it. The cancellation of Weinstein was long, drawn out, and painful for the victims, on top of the pain they had already endured. Yet it became the only solution for women like Hayek, who had no other options and little else to lose. As the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Hamer and Hayek all learned, council culture is not something to act on lightly. It must be rooted in addressing forces that represent a threat to a person or group's full existence. A person's right to life, freedom, and dignity must be threatened to merit the extremeness of cancellation. And when it comes to extremes, both the potential effects of cancellation and the effort risk-taking required to cancel must be fully considered. White supremacy merits cancellation because it seeks to erode diversity, equity, and inclusion of non-white people. Gun violence merits cancellation because it is a matter of life and death. Sexual assault merits cancellation. But if someone on social media tells the world not to eat chocolate cake because they don't like the taste, that isn't cancel culture. Chocolate cake cannot threaten anyone's life and liberty. Now, if the company making the chocolate cake is supporting anti-LGBTQIA causes, said chocolate cake would be a symbol of bigotry and could be canceled. Remember, tea wasn't canceled by the Sons of Liberty because of its taste, but because it was overtaxed by the oppressive British monarchy at the time. Personal tastes don't dictate council culture. Contrary to the opinions of mainstream pundits and critics, Everyone and everything isn't being canceled. Daniela Capistrano, a queer non-binary activist and founder and CEO of DCAP Media, says, When we talk about canceling someone, in many cases we are talking about an abuse of power. Someone commits an act so heinous, violent, or unethical that those calling them out or demanding that they either relinquish the power that they abused or that their power be taken away, whether it's their high-powered job or role in government. On the interpersonal level, often counseling someone is an act of self-preservation. The person counseling the other person has decided that they aren't going to spend any more time trying to educate the offender, to help them see the light. They're simply going to publicly disclose the harm they experienced at the hands of this person and then cut them out of their life 
with the idea that perhaps others will follow suit. Capistrano makes a good point and that you can't always control the outcome of cancel culture. You can speak your truth and hope that encourages other people to join you, but you might find it necessary to go ahead and make your statement without knowing if they will. Cancel culture is political, deliberate, and conscious. It's not a matter of taste, a difference of opinion, or simply a publicity stunt. Whether someone is ultra-conservative or far left, the decision-making behind canceling something is based in one's fundamental desire to survive and feel safe. Individual interpretations on what's right and wrong will forever be debated, but that's not what makes something cancel culture or not. For example, when Jack Phillips, a Colorado baker, refused to create a custom wedding cake for a same-sex couple in 2012, he was participating in his own form of council culture because he believed that doing such a task infringed on his religious beliefs, which can be an extreme matter of heaven or hell to some. The Colorado Court of Appeals rejected Phillips' claim and said his actions defied Colorado's anti-discrimination laws. The Supreme Court, however, would later rule in 2018 that the state exhibited religious hostility against him. Whether society agreed with the measures taken by Phillips or not, his rationale for why he decided to cancel serving a same-sex couple a wedding cake perfectly fits what cancel culture truly is. For him, doing so was forcing him to compromise his religious beliefs beyond the threshold of standard decency. Had Phillips refused to serve them a non-wedding cake simply for being gay, that would have been discriminatory and based on their identity alone. But the Supreme Court argued that forcing Phillips to make a cake for a same-sex wedding in particular, a ceremonial practice that his faith defines as being between a man and a woman, was hostile to his religious beliefs. Similarly, a black baker could refuse to make a cake that had white supremacy rhetoric written on it because the message threatened their way of life. In other words, cancel culture is a tactic, not just a stance taken solely by conservatives or progressives. Since the beginning of time, opinions have been shared whether they were informed or not. These kinds of critiques shape the way we view the world around us. Many believe cancel culture is just about criticizing something you don't like, as if it's simply individuals venting in public for a reaction. Critics aren't in the business of canceling things. They simply give their perspective on how they feel we should consume something. This isn't cancel culture. Professional critics aren't responsible for dictating and or mobilizing legislative social change. They simply give you a thorough take that offers you the agency to decide for yourself. The way the internet and largely social media has blurred the lines between general criticism and cancel culture has been a disservice to the public. When celebrities complain about a bad review, they can't blame it on cancel culture. When people took to social media to express their disdain for the 2020 film Wonder Woman 1984, the movie didn't pose a threat to anyone's humanity. Sure, some felt the movie wasted a precious two hours they couldn't ever get back, but that was due to massive plot holes and lukewarm acting. As we discussed in the previous chapter, when the NAACP boycotted the 1915 silent film, The Birth of a Nation, it was a form of cancel culture because the movie was attempting to demoralize and promote violence toward Black people. The film was being canceled by Black activists and allies because it was cinematic white supremacy, not just the movie that had lackluster cinematography and writing. There were similar complaints of racism surrounding classic films such as Gone with the Wind and Breakfast at Tiffany's, which also faced calls for the public not to watch them. When debates around personal opinions and council culture are treated as being one and the same, we lose the ability to recognize matters that require direct action. Whew. I told y'all it was going to be lit. I am super excited that y'all get to hear it. Um, as you can see, I come with some some thoughts, a lot of thoughts. And um, I can't wait for you all to dive in <laughs> um, and get with this cool preview. Uh, shout out to McMillan 
um, audio for uh, supporting this and, of course, producing my podcast. I mean, my audio book. I'm, like, so jittery right now. Because um, I also got some cool news. Um, that kind of is, like, a little bit of breaking because I just finally got to see this. So I want to read it out loud, actually, because um, it is enough time for me to read it. So shout out to the Philadelphia... Well, shout out to Patrick Rappa, who um, did a book review for my book for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, It's actually a part of a lineup called The Best New Books for February. Um, So it was a lot of love there. The Best New Books for February. Um, Scary Sequels, Great Escapes, and Other Walks on the Wild Side. And it was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is interesting because, you know. Um, So this is what he said about my book. For that reason, Ernest Owens, a freelance journalist for the New York Times, Washington Post, etc., and an accomplished potster at Philadelphia Magazine, takes a pointed but measured approach, tracing its path from black Twitter to the larger consciousness and laying out its intersections with race, gender, politics, and pop culture. Owens is especially effective when recounting his personal adventures in, council, in the council culture realm, from criticizing the mummers to sparking a nat- national conversation about cultural appropriation with a single tweet to Justin Simberlake. Nice, nice. So, thanks Patrick Rappa um, for that. And super excited about just all the the buzz that the book has gotten. There's so many more exciting announcements to come um things are really really getting geared up and this was such a cool like special edition episode wasn't expecting to do it just kind of was like why not because so many people wanted to hear from me about um what's been going on out here in these streets and you know gotta get myself ready you know this is the middle of the week and you know i have something coming up over the weekend so as always be well and be best earnestly speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Ernestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ernestowens.com.